right, welcome back. It's now time to talk about legislative oversight, which is one of the tripartite uh, functions of the uh, legislative arm of government, representation, oversight, and every other thing they have to do in terms of legislation. So we're being joined in the program by Honorable Bami Dele Salam, is the Chairman House Committee on Public Accounts. He joins us from uh, Abuja City. Honorable, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Nigerians. Uh, all right, before we go to issues of oversight and uh, has to do with the National Assembly, let, let's have your quick take on the conversation we just left off, the issue of uh, the anticipated nationwide protest that is generating literal palpable anxiety on the side of government and the side of other people. Because now, uh, like we say, it's a bit of a conflict as to how government wants to manage human rights as against national security. Well, uh, let, let me start off by um, admitting that uh, indeed there are quite uh, a lot of challenges, especially economic pressure. Uh, at the moment in the country, there is uh, a lot of um, failed expectations, let me put it that way. Um, you know, amongst the populace, there is um, a whole lot of, uh, of, of economic frustration, if you must say. Uh, but the question, again, is, uh, you know, what is the way forward? What is the way out? Yes, fundamentally, you know, uh, protests are, are constitutionally recognized as a form of expressing dissent or uh, expect, expect, I mean, uh, expressing expectations from considered authority. But even that freedom, even that, um, you know, guaranteed freedom has to be exercised within the limit of the ambit of the law. And, uh, you know, the law anticipates anticipate orderliness, anticipates, um, you know, a rule of law, and people are not doing things that can uh, put other citizens at risk in whatever manner. So the, the dilemma that, um, you know, uh, people in, in, in government space will have at the moment is how to balance this constitutionally guaranteed freedom of the people of, to expression and the need for us to also protect uh, society from anarchy and, um, you know, lawlessness. And that's where I think, um, you know, government is also trying to find balance. Apart from the fact that government um, uh, needs to do more engagement with the populace, uh, more engagement, especially with the youthful population that we have in Nigeria, you know, that are under a lot of pressure at the moment, unemployment, uh, inflation, insecurity, all manner of issues. But like I said, even even though there is the platform that guarantees that people can uh, protest as a form of expression, there is also the need to balance that with um, orderliness, uh, you know, public order, and uh, ensuring that there is no resort to anarchy in in the society. And uh, so far, uh, so good. I want to think that government is um, taking appropriate measures. I've listened to. Uh, the Minister of Information communicates the feelings of the President and the fact that he's committed to doing things in a better way that can alleviate the sufferings of the people. I've also listened to, um, you know, some state governors also coming out, um, you know, to uh, enunciate programs and policies that can cushion the effect of the hard times on the people. But I think we need to do more as a government to engage with the populace and to uh, let those who are agitating for the protest know that, yes, at times you, you know how some of these things begin, but you may not know how it ends. Uh, and the, the quick reference is always to the NSAS protest. We started as a free uh, expression of, um, of, of uh, frustration with the way the uh, special anti-robbery squad was, um, you know, handling the citizens. But eventually we also what it uh, turned into in most part of the world, I mean, most part of the country, uh, you know, at that time. So I want to think that um, in the next few days, government will do more to engage with the populace and also uh, churn out uh, programs and policies that will be very intentional, uh, you know, at uh, taking away this very, very uh, worrisome economic pressure on the, on the average citizen of this country. All right, Honorable, I know that besides being a politician, you have a, you're a lawyer, you have a background in journalism, so you're well-grounded. Uh, on all of this. So this is why I'm asking you this particular question. Uh, because we've seen time and again, after that NSAS protest, and uh, many times within the Buhari administration and coming into this administration, whenever there's issue of 
people rising to protest for any reason. There is always anxiety. There is always fear. There is always this subtle threat from, you know, public institutions like the DSS. Oh, we know you have a right to protest, but there's always intelligence or disruption. I don't know whether there's any time where there's no intelligence or disruption uh, when people want to agitate of some sort. So the concern a lot of people are having is that how much can the people bear? Because if you intimidate them or try to cow them to go back and say, don't protest because security this, because security this and the other, you may have that intelligence. There's something that pent up anger can do. Because if we don't allow the people to express themselves legitimately in an atmosphere of peace without rancor, uh, the day they may even wake up one day without announcing a date could be very detrimental. I want you to help us uh, manage that this particular uh, issue that we're dealing with as far as worry about national security as against managing pent-up anger by the people? Okay, let me, let me uh, start off by saying I, I actually identify with those sentiments that you express on, on the need for uh, people to have platform for, for free expression as a way of also... Um, you know, a deepening engagement one, also as a way of, um, you know, avoiding the consequences of not being able to express oneself. But you see, we have to put everything in a historical context. Uh, you know, we have, we have antecedents, we have precedent. Um, I've seen demonstrations where demonstrators, for example, block roads, not allowing vehicles to move. And I've seen, for instance, people who have medical emergencies not being able to move as a result of protesters, you know, blocking road. I've seen uh, media men uh, being harassed, being uh, beaten up, um, you know, uh, almost lynched by protesters. I've seen all manner of things resulting out of protests. So what, what, I, what I'm saying is that, yes, we agree that uh, there is a need. I, well, I, also had, I had a background of protest. I was a student union activist. And, um, you know, in those days of the military era, we had all manner of... Uh, you know, clashes with the military, uh, you know, as student union activists and what have you. But again, there has to be a line. And that line is that where one's, one's right, you know, ends, another person's right begins. If you're going to protest, fine and good. Can we draw the line? Can we express ourselves in a manner that will not infringe on the right of other citizens, that will not also lead to disruptions in the social and economic activities of other persons? I've seen protesters gone to lock up people's shops and saying they must not open their shops to sell. I've seen protesters, um, you know, during the last uh, Nigerian Labour Congress uh, and TUC strike, going to shut down the national grid, shut down the power stations, you know, that provide electri electricity for hospitals, for homes, for schools, you know, for what have you. Now, these are some of the things that we need to, you know, find a balance to. And so if you see security men appearing to be um, hyperactive, in trying to prevent all this, I think they are also learning from the very, uh, you know, sad uh, experience of the past. And I think what we also need to do is to get the civil society, you know, to have a better understanding of how uh, some of these things can be organized in a manner that will portray us also to the rest of the world as being civil people who have an, who have an understanding of how to drive home our point and our issues without being violent, without being crude, without being, uh, you know, intrusive onto other person's, uh, you know, freedom, uh, you know, as well. So yeah. I think the, the, so, the whole, the most important thing as far as I'm concerned is finding that balance and for government to realize that there has to be a lot more to be done by all tiers of government indeed. to, you know, uh, to assuage the pains of the populace. There is a whole lot of anger in the land. There is hunger, there is unemployment, there is, you know, all manner of pressure, mm -hmm. you know, on people. And unless government is very intentional and very demonstrative, and we can see the evidence and the result of that seriousness, there will always be all these kind of issues of people wanting to protest, wanting to do all manner of things, you know, only to express themselves. It, it all, you know, boils so, down to having so a honorable. more responsive and responsible, you know, governance system. Yeah, and it's because of all those implications of uh, protests, uh, you know, at different times in the history of the country, uh, that perhaps uh, security agents should take full responsibility of managing um, the organization, uh, the conduct, and indeed 
uh, possible implications of the protest. But let's move on uh, to the real issue, uh, which would form the crux of our conversation. Oversight, uh, one of the core functions of the legislative arm of government. Uh, I wonder if you uh, have been you know, monitoring actively uh, the, the opinion of commentators on the character and outlook of uh, this 10th Assembly. Uh, many are not enamored by the, uh, this legislature, uh, it, uh, either in terms of scrutiny of the policies of the executive presented before it, or in the management of whistleblowers, or in the oversight of MDAs in the first place. Uh, in fact, some go as far as saying that uh, this 10th Assembly is part and parcel of the executive. So let's start on that generic term before we begin to look at the core issues. What are your thoughts on this perception of this 10th Assembly? Well, I, I want to uh, state with, uh, with respect that that perception, if it actually exists, is not a very correct perception. Uh, the, the legislature, as an arm of government that is created specifically by Section 4 of the Constitution, um, has rules and responsibilities clearly defined by the Constitution. Yes, we operate a system of government that allows for uh, separation of powers, but it also allows for checks and balances. Now, I understand that what you're saying is that, you know, the public most probably expects more of the checks and balances in the uh, operation of our legislative functions. Now, this is not peculiar to the 10th Assembly. It's been, it's been on for so many uh, you know, assemblies of people wanting to see more of a brawl between the executive and the legislature than any other thing. Conversely, again, when there is this kind of a brawl, for example, the type you had uh, in the 8th Assembly, for example, uh, when uh, Bukola Saraki and Dogara were heading the parliament and you had uh, a not, not too frosty, uh, very frosty relationship between the executive and the parliament, the public also comes to bash the parliament because the expectations of the people is that there will be service delivery. And that is the whole purpose of government. So anything that will result into a halt into service delivery, for example, delays in the passage of budget, which we have had in so many years, at times running up to March, April, or May of a year before a budget is passed, will again result in the bashing of the legislature by the same commentators. And when the legislature also takes it upon itself to have a more speedy, you know, passage of that budget. I just used the, the budget issue as an example. You have people also coming on the other side. Oh, no. Why is it that it's everything that the executive brings, you know, that gets, uh, you know, that gets approved by the parliament? I think, you know, uh, the understanding of, of, our, of the electorate, of the people, about the actual kind of relationship that should exist between the legislature and the executive it's very paramount to understanding why some of these things happen. Very recently, we saw what happened. Uh, you know, uh, you know that was in the ninth assembly when the when the, the 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 ruling party that has even the majority in the parliament could not succeed in getting some things passed by the same legislature. Now, in every democracy, we we operate a party democracy. As at the moment, the All Progressive Congress, which is the party that formed the executive, has a clear majority in the legislature. So you will definitely expect that most of the things that will come out of the literature will, will, uh, will, uh, agree with what is in the parliament, as, I mean, the executive, especially on the basis of the fact that they have an agenda, they have a manifesto, which they brought. Now the question will be, those of us who are in the opposition, how much are we doing to now provide alternate views, alternate positions, alternate programs, alternate, uh, you know, perspectives to issues that the executive bring? And uh, within the limit of what is, um, you know, uh, allowed in a democracy, I think the 10th Assembly has been up and doing. There has been quite a lot of times when, uh, you know, issues get debated very intensely, even, even if they will eventually get um, passed or approved. They, are, they, are, they, they, they go through very deep uh, scrutiny. And even some people who are members of the ruling party, the All Progressive Congress, on the floor of the parliament, have been known to bring motions that are very critical of programs and policies of the government. And, and this is how, you know, uh, the legislature should, should work ordinarily. If what people expect is that at every turn, at every point in time, there should be brawl between the executive and the legislature, that whatever the, uh, you know, executive brings, 
um, you know, should be shut down or delayed or whatever. The, the, the public governance is what eventually, you know, will suffer because but, but a lot of things will be delayed. Uh, and and if, when if there I is may that delay, follow people up also there, ask honorable. questions from government. If I may quickly follow up there, while a, a brawl is not necessarily expected, perhaps ideal questions would be, you know, what is expected. For instance, you know, Jeffrey said at the uh, start of the, uh, uh, midway into the last segment about how the last administration plunged the country into debt with the approval, uh, the last legislature rather, with the approval of ways and means. And what we're seeing yet again, you know, under this uh, current administration is the express approval of extra budgetary spending of 6.2 trillion naira that will bring uh, this budget to more than 30 trillion naira. And uh, one would ask why no scrutiny has been brought to bear upon this extra spending, particularly because of uh, burgeoning debt and you know, the reality of the, uh, 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 the exchange rates, the naira to the dollar. How do you weigh in on this? Well, well thank you very much. Let me just quick, let, but let me, let me quickly correct something. When you say extra budgetary expenditure, what was brought is not an extra budgetary expenditure. It's a supplementary Supplementary budget. expenditure. Now, extra budgetary means supplementary expenditure. That, you know, that are being spent that were not, you know, ex expended. And uh, you remember very well, you recall that, um, you know, the president brought this request with specific provisions made in the, uh, in the bill that was brought. And those provisions cover issue of, uh, you know, uh, providing food security, issue of fixing infrastructure, issues that have to do with uh, providing more for security agencies to be able to combat uh, some of the security challenges that uh, we do have. Now, one other thing that I want the public to understand is that most of the work of the parliament actually happens at the committee levels. And that is where the issue of oversight comes in. If you, and, and, and of course, I know the Chinese television uh, covered the engagement of the appropriation committee, for example, with the Honorable Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister of Budget, about two weeks ago. And that was a very, very intense, you know, uh, interaction uh, between the public, uh, the, the appropriation committee representing the House of Reps and these key ministers of government. In fact, at a point, you could see members' frustration at the delay in the implementation of the 2024 budget. As a follow-up to that, the committee I chair, the Public Account Committee, also had an engagement with the Honorable Minister of Finance and the Committee Minister of the Economy on this same issue, where we extracted commitments from, from government on the speedy implementation of the content of the 2024 budget, regardless of whatever is running on the 2023 uh, you know, budget. The same thing happens at so many other committee levels where you know, parliament uh, uh, members of the legislature engage with the executive to scrutinize, you know, uh, proposals, laws that have been brought, policies and budget. And this is where most of the activities of the, of the legislature actually takes place because the section 62 of the constitution actually gives the, the parliament the power to create these committees and assign to them responsibilities in a manner that will allow us to be more efficient. At times where, where, you, where you, know, you are in plenary, you have limited number of hours, you have 360 members, everybody wanting to speak, you hardly have a very thorough engagement of issues in that kind of a forum. Unfortunately, that is the forum that is most projected as the, as the business of the parliament. But the most of the business of the parliament happens at the committee level. The engagement, the scrutiny, the conversation, the questioning, the, the very um, you know, interrogative a nature of, of, of legislature is felt through the committees. And this happens in a manner that, you know, does not even have any coloration of political parties. Committees that are headed by members of the ruling party will engage with honorable ministers, with heads of agencies and departments, you know, in a manner that you will, you will wonder whether they are even of the same political party because that is what the legislature is. So uh, this new, uh, the, the, um, the uh, supplementary budget has specific provisions. And these are issues that come in the course of implementation of a budget. That's why well, they are called supplementary where, budget. Because the president having been elected on a particular mandate and being the man that is in charge of running the affairs of the government Honorable has Bami, a duty to day-to-day -day insight into issues that come up. If and I, if any I, issue co ke, uh, comes up that was not, yeah, let me, let me that was not envisaged in the previous budget, it behoves on the executive to come to the panel and legislature and ask for more funding 
to do this thing. The, uh, the only thing is that we well, must be able well, to now track the funds to be sure that they are properly deployed. All right, Honorable, we're almost out of time. Your committee is a very, very important committee, public accounts, which has to do with um, sitting to review audit findings. And uh, I'm wondering what you have. You, you were in the ninth, and this is the 10th uh, National Assembly. Uh, and given the, the alleged leakages and thefts and corruption we've seen, we expect a lot of things from your committee because... Uh, when you look at the books, sometimes they don't pan out uh, at the end of the day in terms of what is uh, budgeted for, uh, what was expended, as to what we can identify as these monies were expended for. So one is wondering with work your, the work your committee is doing in collaboration perhaps with the EFCC, why don't we have as many public officials in jail as they should be for stealing our commonwealth, allegedly? Okay, thank you very much. You are very correct. The Public Account Committee um, is a committee that deals mostly with issues of ensuring that um, public funds are spent uh, lawfully, are spent judiciously. And uh, in, I, I can only speak about this assembly uh, where, where I have the privilege of heading that committee. If you have been following the uh, media reportage of the activities of this committee, you will discover that um, we have actually done quite a lot in exposing some of the uh, malfeasance and um, outright impunity uh, that public officials have undertaken in the expenditure of public funds. Let me give an example of the, uh, the investigation into the COVID-19 expenditure, which we carried out and submitted. We laid the report before the House just before the, you know, the break. Now, the COVID, the COVID uh, pandemic was a global disaster. And one would expect that the sum of almost uh, 2 trillion naira that was voted into combating the effect of the pandemic, fixing infrastructure, reflecting the economy, will be substantially used for those purposes. But unfortunately, you know, what we discovered there were very mind-boggling. You know, a lot of diversion of public funds from the purpose for which they were meant. Um, you know, there are, there are instances where uh, people apply for this money and never even bother to give an account of it. But again, the way we also work, we have, we have submitted a report before the House which I'm sure the House is giving attention to consider as soon as we resume from, uh, you know, from, the, from the recess. And the findings of such a report is what we can now transmit to the EFCC, to the ICPC, to the Nigerian Police Force, and other organs of government, uh, you know, which have the responsibility of enforcing uh, you know, the laws. We are, we, are, we are lawmakers. Again, this is a lacuna in our own law. In some other parts of the world, there's a public account tribunal in some other countries, even in Africa, where, uh, you know, findings of the Public Account Committee goes directly to that tribunal because submitting those reports to EFCC, ICPC, and whatever, again, it's like reporting the executive to the executive, you know, which also has its own, uh, you know, downside. So there are quite a whole lot, and I agree with you absolutely that, um, you know, we run a country where impunity, um, you know, is the order of the day. Uh, out right. of every 10 naira that is voted, as public expenditure, probably up to five, six naira, are either wasted or stolen or diverted. And this is not a good thing for a country that is, that is uh, struggling with so much, uh, you know, deficit in infrastructure and, in, you know, welfare and so on and so forth. Right. So I assure you that the Public Account Committee uh, of the 10th Assembly, which I have the privilege of, uh, of chairing, is up and doing. Our right. meetings are covered mostly by, the, you know, by almost all media. And, uh, you know, the findings that we make are also made very public. And all quite right, a lot has happened in terms of our investigation. You just spoke about leakages now. Uh, there's an investigation on Remita and the leakages of government fund, which, which has resulted into quite a whole lot of uh, discoveries. Uh, we had instances where people have refunded money back into government coffers. We have, we have, we have directed money to be refunded. A particular ministry got 10 billion naira that was meant for establishing a COVID vaccine, um, a COVID, you know, vac all vaccine right. facility which was never spent and never returned. We recovered that money back into government treasury all right, uh, earlier this year and so we're, many others. Honorable, like we're, we're, total, we're totally out of time, Honorable. We, we must thank you. And we will be inviting you a lot more since you're in public accounts because we need to know how our monies are spent and uh, in collaboration with the EFCC because thank you so much. Uh, one of the shouts on the EFCC is the fact that it's great to tackle Yahoo boys uh, and stop them from, you know, internet fraud. But there are bigger fishes to fry. Politicians who are stealing our monies, allegedly. And some, uh, it's even difficult to get them to take a plea in court, allegedly for 
the money is not only whether politicians, or not politicians, not. So we must thank civil you. servants, some private businesses and contractors and concerns, all, right. all the spectrum. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable, Honorable Bami Dele Salam is the Chairman House thank Committee on Public thank Accounts. You thank you, sir, for coming on the program. Thank you so much. All right, we will take a quick break. When we come back, we'll meet Hero Daniels. Who is he? Well, I guess you know. Join us again.